entrepreneurship for me is there's so much more to it than it being startup life, mm. right? It's often um, seen as this glamorous lifestyle. I mean, I think I made a post the other day on LinkedIn that it's not sipping cocktails and sitting on a beach with your laptop, right? I wish. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, we'd all be entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. It, it's a roller coaster, you know, it's a roller coaster in the dark. Mm. You don't know what's coming. That's a really good analogy. Like, yeah, yeah. It's wild, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um and and media makes it look so exciting and glamorous. And and I said the other day, it's more like Indiana Jones than it is James Bond. <laughs> right? James Bond sitting on cocktails, may may shoot a few people and yeah. have some fun and be with a woman. Indiana Jones is, is getting it's caught like, in traps holy and, fuck, and, and trying to find all his way down. out. <laughs> and we're all hoping <laughs> Hi, welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Stu Kagan, um, who I have actually known for a number of years. He was the founder of Endless Metals, and he and his wife, Lisa, um, we all worked together for a period of time. So welcome to the studio. Thanks, Debs. Awesome to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So you've got quite an interesting kind of background and story, haven't you? Why don't you start by telling us a bit about yourself? And oh, before we get started, I should tell you guys, we've been chatting before this um, podcast, uh, yeah. and we've decided that if you're going to listen to this, you might want to put it onto half speed because we both speak and think at a million miles an hour. Absolutely. So just a word of warning here. <laughs> yeah. Ghost you. Tell us your story. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on, yeah. It's exciting to be here and uh, lovely to chat to you, obviously, like usual. Um. Yeah, we arrived in New Zealand. My wife and I and our, our one-year-old kid arrived in New Zealand seven years ago, or nearly seven years ago now. And um, being fresh off the boat, we kind of both got stuck into our day jobs and um, spent a bit of time looking at at what where the opportunities could be. Mm-hmm. I had experience in metal recycling because I had worked in the largest recycling metal recycling company in sub-Saharan Africa for... Mm-hmm. About 20 years when I got here. Yep. And I worked from starting off as a laborer there, actually, to end up, I ended up running the whole company, 4,200 people, 85 yards um, throughout sub Saharan Africa. And when we arrived here, um, we saw the opportunity in the recycling space um, to do things better and to actually um, incentivize the people of New Zealand to, to recycle more. And that meant actually selling on export, getting the best prices possible and passing it on through to the um, suppliers of the metal, Mm -hmm. which we did. So Endless Metals has been going now just over five years and we had extremely rapid growth, not without its problems, but we had some serious growth. And uh, yeah, within five years, we were one of the fastest growing companies in New Zealand based on the Deloitte Fast 50, uh, which we uh, regrettably didn't enter at the time, but we got to see everybody else's results. (laughs) And so we would have um, done quite well in that. Uh, yeah, we we grew in, in what we thought was an incredible business and uh, it was lots of fun doing it. The objective in the beginning was to create a business where people looked forward to Mondays. Yes. That was uh, Lisa and I were on a walk once and we both had jobs here and we were going, well, yeah, we we're kind of not excited about going to work the next day. Mm-hmm. And um, we said, well, wouldn't it be amazing to work somewhere where we actually were excited and Sunday came, we're like, oh, I can't wait to go and see my friends and, and do something that I'm passionate about. And it was probably on that day that we decided to, to delve further into it and look further. And, um, Lisa did a deep dive as she does. She's an ex-management consultant, yes. looked into the industry and, um, thought there was an opportunity and she was right. And yeah, we exited that company just a few months ago in January. And um, now we're on to other exciting things. I know. I got a few things in the pipeline. So I know that, I mean, I, I it was really evident. I saw that in the the Endless Metals, the actual culture you had built was around a team of people who loved working together, loved what they did. They were kind of living that whole EOS life that we talk about. And EOS is all about kind of harnessing the energy of your people and making the most of it. So why did you decide to bring EOS into the business? Um Oh, well, I'm I'm very thankful we did. Um, and I shouldn't say we there. That was very much a decision made by my lovely wife, who was <laughs> adamant that we were on a treadmill. Um, yep. The growth that we were going at, um, we we used to use the analogy that um, I would jump off a cliff and Lisa would build the airplane on the way down. <laughs> um, and what it felt like was that the airplane was um, soaring to new heights on a daily basis, yep. but we were losing parts of it as we did it. Um, it was quite difficult to carry on that trajectory without, um, you know, just losing losing what we had set out to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was affecting the culture. Um, and if you didn't have your systems in place, 
uh, we definitely felt that we were losing that trajectory or, or that trajectory wouldn't be long lived, we felt. So that was one of the reasons we, we came across. And as I said, uh, it was an amazing decision made by my wife. And uh, yeah, we never looked back. <laughs> and so you are what I would consider a typical visionary. Um, and I think yeah. that's one of the things I loved about EOS is it actually gave you this this definition of what a visionary is there for. Because like we're considered completely crazy until we actually change the world. Then suddenly we're, we're geniuses. Um, but a, a visionary typically thinks fast, talks fast, big ideas, always challenging everything. But it can be dangerous if there isn't some kind of structure around that, right? Well, it was exactly what I thought about when you asked me. I thought one of the first <laughs> things I was going to mentioned was um, the definition. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's having somebody define what Lisa and I were doing on a day-to-day -day basis was hugely um, helpful for us because we were both going off in different ways mm -hmm. and we operated in different ways. So it was it was really helpful. And I am focusing really on talking slowly today, just so, um, <laughs> just so you are aware. <laughs> I do talk really quickly. And, and as you've always said, the visionary often will run off and on a million in a million different ways yep. it also the the definition gave me the ability to i guess respect what lisa did more mm. and to understand that without her i couldn't do what i did yeah because i would get pulled into so many of the things that i didn't enjoy doing and i wasn't good at yeah right? um and having lisa there as my right hand and and knowing that you know we were doing this together and, and i could go off and a million different ways and, and a million different thoughts and chase the shiny things yep. um, and have her keep pulling me back into place and, and, keep us on the right trajectory yep. uh, was really was really helpful. And so Lisa took on the role of the integrator. And so that Absolutely. integrator is generally the person who is um, a little bit of a, a filter between the visionary and the rest of the company. It's not that we don't <laughs> truly appreciate all the wonderful ideas and where you're headed, yeah, yeah. but sometimes we find that if the visionary is allowed to have completely free reign, they'll have all these people running around, you know, doing crazy things when we haven't actually decided that was the focus. And so the integrator gives that, that um, a filter for the visionary um, before it gets to the main leadership team. But also they're the one kind of beating the drum, keep, as you said, building that, that, that airplane as you're kind of yeah. <laughs> taking yeah. off um, so that the whole team knows where they're headed, what they're doing, what the focus is, and keeps them all on the same page, doesn't, oh, don't they? I mean, that, that's a, a great explanation of what they did, yeah. or what she did. Um, I was off in many different, many different directions and often in meetings yeah. and often in meetings, I would say, well, this is where we're going next. And, and this is the new exciting things. And, and <laughs> we're going to pivot into um, cardboard, paper and plastic, or we're about to move into, to waste long before we were meant to. And mm -hmm. uh, all those sort of things would, um, I don't want to say upset, but it, it did. Yeah, definitely distract. Um, yeah. The team would kind of be, okay, well, this is where we're going now, but we hadn't necessarily finished what we were doing. Yeah. Um, and that's what I was saying about the airplane going one way, but actually the engine was falling off the back, <laughs> yeah. right? So yeah. the trajectory looks great, but but you're in for a crash landing. Yeah. So I'm just interested, I'm, and, and obviously I'm a big fan of EOS, but if you think about the, what was the the one tool? I mean, we've talked about the fact that you had this definition of the vision of the integrator, mm. that's really important, mm. but what was the tool that probably made them, had the most impact in the business for you? Yeah, so the visionary integrator um, was a great opportunity to define, but it wasn't the best tool mm. um, that we got. So it was a, a mace, a, a, an amazing, an amazing, an amazing um, definition that gave us. However, the best tool that I think um, we got was, um, I think those level 10 meetings, yep. I think that's what we called them. <laughs> yes. Um, those meetings gave the, just the structure they had. Firstly, that you didn't have so many meetings in a week was mm. immediately really helpful because we were meeting about meetings to plan for the next meeting where we were going to strategize about a meeting. Like it was, it was <laughs> just like council. It was, it was ridiculous, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And, and often it was my doing. And I'd be like, guys, oh, let's everybody get together. We need to talk about something. I hadn't planned or what we were going to talk about yet. So you had your weekly meeting. Um, but what I loved about the structure of that meeting, of those meetings, was my favorite thing was we didn't discuss what somebody brought up for the first half an hour. Mm. So we went through the process, which if you've done EOS, you will learn that process and it's a phenomenal process. And only once you finish that process, you go to the list of things that, or items or topics that have come up yeah. and you then decide what is important to discuss. And when we were doing that, so many people made mention of the fact that how many meetings did we have prior to this where we had an say, for example, it was an hour meeting. We spent the first 45 minutes talking about the first thing that came up and it happened to only be important to the first person that was speaking in that meeting, yep. which is often me, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, but 
all of a sudden you go around the circle and then when everybody's done and you finish your first half an hour, whatever that time was, you get to that last bit to discuss or to choose what the topic's going to be. Mm -hmm. And you get through some serious gems. Mm -hmm. Like you realize what came up first wasn't even important. And if that person who spoke last didn't get the time to talk, well, this company, we wouldn't have sorted out that problem that was so huge and weighing on this person. Um, that was really, really beneficial. There are other things as well. Yep. Um, but, but it that does was it, that, that changes because we actually, as you know, in EOS, we actually don't go into the vision and the long term stuff in the beginning. We actually teach these tools. Yeah. And the reason we teach these tools is to put, start putting some structure, some discipline, accountability in place. And I think you're absolutely right because the first 25 minutes is all about reporting. So it just, you know, it's like giving a bit of an update, um, professional, personal best. We go through our scorecard, we go through our rocks, we go through our to do list, we go through our customer and employee headlines. And it's only once we've done all of that, we kind of get into the list of issues yeah. and uh, it's amazing how that discipline can just change it because I know that even when you've got a scorecard or a dashboard for example the first person to report if it's a salesperson will want to tell you exactly why they <laughs> haven't hit their numbers exactly. or what's been going on and then suddenly you get to the end of the meeting and find out you've just lost a major client because we, and we didn't get around to that I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody's got other meetings they've got to run off to that's and right people yeah are over this meeting you've got to move on but yeah you didn't deal with the client that yeah you just lost. and so the, exactly the whole thing right. of having an issues list first of all before you even start and picking the top three because yeah. the idea is if you only ever discuss one thing in that meeting um it's the most important thing that would actually change the business yeah and, yeah and i like the idea that it's um yes the integrator gets a say if we can't decide yeah but it's decided by the group yeah. on what is important mm. because what's important for as you said the salesperson yeah. isn't necessarily important for the majority of the team yeah. so you can discuss the issue that the salesperson has but you're really just solving that one person's problem whereas you might be solving a huge company problem mm -hmm. by waiting for that person at the end or the one that doesn't necessarily speak up as much as a salesperson would i was a salesperson so yeah I yeah yeah speak badly about that <laughs> <laughs> me too that's okay it's all good <laughs> excellent okay and so and the we, those level 10 meetings we did them at the leadership team level to start off with and they kind of get put into departments as mm. well and I, li I like what you said it does reduce the number of meetings because mm. in theory any person should only be in an, in two meetings a week yeah. um their leadership team and one other so the vision we integrate meet once a week uh the sales and marketing team once a meet once a week and then the leadership team so it's cool okay and we and we did that and we rolled yep. it down um really successfully our operations our operations team that had their level 10 mm -hmm. um that meeting probably went better than our senior leadership team meeting they really engaged in it because there were in the senior leadership team, I guess you're used to having these meetings. You're used to being able to speak your, you know, give your point of view and, and you, you feel heard. Yep. Whereas in the ops meeting, the level 10 really got you heard. Mm. Um, you had certain people, we had a shipping lady who, who is phenomenal. Um, and she wasn't necessarily the loudest speaker in the room. Yeah. So she never got the opportunity to talk about her issues, but now she was forced to. And it's like, what is it? And often the team would go, wow, we didn't know that. Let's deal with that. Mm. And that was really helpful. So the ops um, roll down of that level 10 was extremely well received. Yeah, you're absolutely right because, I mean, we're, we're naturally kind of vivacious people who will push our point of view whether exactly. you want to hear it or not. Exactly. <laughs> but exactly but right. there's a lot of people who actually don't get that. And it's also what I love about it is it is about – so it's not um, decision by committee, but it is actually all working together for the greater good. And sometimes the person who has the answer is not necessarily the person who's working with it day in, day out. And so by actually having that group um, effort, if you like, they can actually go, oh, you know, I've got an idea around that. So we're actually looking for all possible ideas. And if sometimes I, those ideas come from the strangest places. I usually have the answer for everything it doesn't mean it's the right answer <laughs> yeah that's right yeah, but yeah. i'm very willing to answer all the questions yes and, and that's where lisa would always um get me back under control and go no this isn't for you mm, right yeah. yes you're the founder yes you might be running the company you're the visionary this isn't for you to answer mm. we need to table this around let everybody give their input and then let's come up with the answer so often i wasn't allowed to speak first what we found as well in that process was because some, especially in the beginning, not everybody would give their input on a topic that wasn't necessarily um, something they knew a lot about, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe it was a sales team um, and then the shipping person didn't want to necessarily comment on that. Once people felt more comfortable and I didn't speak first, yes, all of a sudden we got better results. Uh. When I spoke first, you found everybody went my route because yep. I was the leader. I was I know, the extrovert, you're, yeah. visionary, you're the owner, right? And yeah. kind of if I say that, everybody all of a sudden agreed with me. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if I let everybody else speak first and I then spoke later on, um, we got much better results. And it was quite hard for me in the beginning. Um, <laughs> to shut up. <laughs> yeah, but Lisa, lucky my wife was my integrator. And yeah. uh, 
uh, I knew I knew to behave when she spoke. And I have to say, I mean, she was a fantastic integrator, probably one of the best ones I've ever worked with mm. in terms of she's very, very good at sticking to that process. I'll get on the show, actually. It'd be fun to have her kind of viewpoint as well. Yeah. What's it like um, as a husband and wife? Like, did, did EOS help? Because working together, I know you guys love each other. I know you love working together. Yeah, but there do. can be some really tough times, right? When you're working with your business partner, who's also your life partner, yeah. what are some of the challenges that you face? And did EOS help with any of that? I think... Um, Working together is challenging. Absolutely. Mm. I think the biggest challenge is um, never switching off. Yeah. So especially when you got, we have two young kids yeah. at home. Um, we'd often find ourselves, I say often, we'd always find ourselves at the dinner table speaking about what's happening in the day and strategy. Mm. And, and and we are quite hard on ourselves and we would um, feel that we were neglecting the kids at the time. And that then spirals and it's like, oh my God, we, we're terrible parents. And But actually we, we're doing our best. Yep. Um, but where it helped and to go back to, it's knowing our roles, mm. right? Having that definition of um, visionary and integrator immediately within the first session, when you explain it, in fact, a good friend of ours, um, Daniel, who um, first introduced us to, yeah, to me, to you, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. He said to us in our first coffee or whatever, when we first met him, he said, you are the epitome of a visionary and an integrator. He, he identified. He and it, then we yeah. looked more into And then when we met you, you explained it and defined it more. And it allowed us when we got home to kind of understand our strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And we immediately knew. Um, and I don't want to say, I guess strength and weaknesses is wrong because Lisa didn't have any weaknesses. Um, I know it sounds crazy. Lisa's um, had could see my weaknesses and she she knew that she could speak to me in a way that I could now understand it mm -hmm. because I had been explained that being a visionary isn't a bad thing. Yeah. It's not a great thing. It's it, it's just what you are. Yeah. And therefore, you'll have your pros and your cons, mm -hmm. right? You'll have your strengths and your weaknesses. And um, she'll be able to speak to me in a way that, well, this is because you're a visionary, love, because you're only seeing the shiny <laughs> things. Let me take control. Let me just tell you, let's stick to the strategy. Yeah. Let's go back to our strategy, which we created in the beginning. Yep. Let's go back to that. And, and this is why we're not going to chase that shiny thing. And then I would understand that, yes, at least that's your role yep. and you're right to pull me in line. And that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but it actually gives, kind of gives you permission to be the, the visionary, which I think that's one of the things I fell in love with about EOS is actually I'd never heard, we talk about visionaries as in people who change the world, mm. but this is actually a, a particular role in a business, right? It's quite clearly defined, yep. which means you can actually kind of go, right, yes, we are a visionary. And then the integrator is another role that could be called COO, GM, whatever, manager, director, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But it's the yeah. person who kind of, you know, helps to to keep that person yeah. in their, I wouldn't say in their boxes, I hate putting people in boxes, but it does. It gives you permission to use language to go, yeah. yep, that's typical of a visionary and, and this is what exactly we're going to do right. um, and Defining vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. cool. Now, how many people were there in the in the team? In, uh, endless. in the company, we had yeah. 75. 75, okay. Yeah. And this got rolled out to all the different departments? The, the, yeah. Um, yeah. And because yeah. I've often had the comment, you know, but the person on the shop floor isn't going to be interested in kind of what goes on. How did they find the structure? Um, so let me rephrase that. We rolled it out to, to all the of the, lev, the management yeah. team. The people on the floor, what happened was they started having – but well, they would have their daily toolbox talk. Yeah. But then they would have a weekly one, which would be um, substantially longer. Yeah. And in that, we didn't follow the exact process of a level 10, mm -hmm. but we took pieces from it, right? Yep. So everybody got the opportunity to communicate um, what was going on in their area. Yeah. And then at the end, we would decide what to discuss. Okay. So using so, the IDS. So, so yeah, we yeah. used the IDS, absolutely. Yep. But because there were, you'd have maybe 25 people in those meetings, it was very difficult to just follow the full process. Mm -hmm. And we obviously had a shortened period we had period that we had to do it in. Yep. Um, but yeah, we were able to roll it out. And, and what you find is as soon as your ops manager or supervisor who's involved in level 10, as soon as they get it, yeah. which they usually do, yes. they go, oh, I want this for my team. Yeah. And they then take that on and they work out what pieces they can use of it. And as I say, the IDS is what it was called. The IDS is what we used. Yeah. There. And it's, you know, at the end of that, it's a framework. I mean, people kind of think, oh, EOS, it's kind of, it's a, it's a model. It's very cookie cutter. It has to be, you know, the same for everybody. I've worked with probably close to 24 companies, I think, so far through the process. And they're all quite different. Yeah. And it is a framework that's designed to give you a bit of structure, a bit of kind of kind of, but without actually being rigid in terms of what you do. And I think in terms of level 10 meetings, you know, yes, they're going to be different lengths depending on what mm. level they are the business yep. it's about using the tools to get the best value for the greater good yeah absolutely um look i really 
I, I, I really enjoyed it. So yeah, yeah no, no question to it. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I know that visionaries often the ones in the beginning kind of go, but I don't want this, you know, um, yeah. and yet they're usually the ones that end up getting, you know, in, really enjoying it in the long run. Exactly right. I mean, yeah. I was the one pushing it at the end, but in the beginning when it was introduced to me, you know, but you used I, to get bored in our I meetings know, too. I, know, I remember I our leadership team meetings in the day. You're like, oh, come on. I was really boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's but, good. Yeah, it was it was an incredible tool that that we um that we implemented. Yep. Yeah, we loved it. But at the same time, it's not rocket science, as you no, say. It's no. really not rocket science, and you can read the book and get an idea for it. However, I, I will say that having somebody help you mm -hmm. through the journey is an absolute must. Now, you can do it yourself, yep. but there's a lot that you will lose out on. Um, so I appreciate you saying that because I've, I've loved working with you guys too. But yeah, yeah, why? Why? What's the difference between doing it yourself and having somebody like me? Oh, there? so so say for example, um, and I don't remember exactly what they were called, but the initial meetings that we had with the you focus there, day, the vision yeah, building, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, we found out when we did right person, right seat. Yes, when we found out um, our person in charge of finance didn't want to be in charge of finance. <laughs> That's right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, There's the whole you, gets it, wants, wants it, has capacity. Wants yeah. it, has capacity. So they, they got it, it, they got the capacity, they didn't want it. They didn't want it, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and that was shocking. Now, would we have got to that if we didn't have a third party, an external person mm -hmm. pushing us to answer those questions? Mm -hmm. So if we sat in a level 10 and we had read the book and we thought, well, let's just go through this. And what I don't think everybody would be as vocal about it because really they'd be speaking to me. Yeah me and Lisa, who the founders, but we were speaking to you. Yeah. So it was very much speaking to an external person and you could, you know, tell exactly how you felt versus speaking to the person who maybe pays your salary. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was very yeah, different. Yeah. We also in that experience as well, um, during that process, we, we had grown, and this is something that, that really was important to us. We had grown from a period of our team doing many different roles, mm -hmm. right? So that's what normally happens. Yeah. Most Start up. You, everybody's doing everything, right? Whatever you and need, then you yeah. <laughs> start all of a sudden needing to create some sort of specialization. And when we were going that route, when we joined you, we had, for example, our HR manager was also doing health and safety. Mm. We needed to go on that journey to try and work out, you know, what did she want? Mm. What did she get? What did she have capacity for? And I think if we had followed our own process, I don't think we'd necessarily got the outcome, would have got the outcome we wanted. Whereas having you take us on that journey, it was kind of, you know, you don't just play a, an EOS role. It was a kind of having a personal coach as well there, a, a company coach, somebody who could, you, they felt very comfortable to speak to because we had a great relationship with you. Mm -hmm. And you could ask the pressing questions. Yeah. You knew in our team when somebody wasn't being 100% honest yep. with you or themselves. I don't know if I've, I've actually shared this on, online or not, but I actually, um, I have name tags on the desks when we run these sessions. And there's actually two reasons for that. First of all, because I think a million miles an hour and I'm in my flow and I sometimes forget somebody's name and I know exactly who they are. The other thing is I use it as a bit of a tool for me. So when I put those out there, I get to choose who sits next to each other. And particularly on the first day, I actually observe the body language and stuff when people see their name and you can see they go, to, uh, oh, Stuart, I'm sitting next to Stuart. And you kind of, they're like oh yeah or it's like oh yeah. and i pick up on that and i use that to actually i call it poking the bear it's like what can i do to see what i can get the most and i'm not doing it because i enjoy it i mean i do but it's, it's yeah, more sure. it's more because i want to actually make sure that we're really getting to the bottom of all the elephants in the room that we're dealing yeah, with the yeah, stuff yeah. that that needs to be said and i think particularly in a family business the sacred cow stuff as well like what is it that's not being said and i mm. as an external person i have the opportunity to do that right i, I don't have to worry about going back into work the next day i can i'm, I'm there to make sure we get the best for the whole overall company absolutely yeah so it's yeah. kind of fun <laughs> no, it's 100 percent. and also um one of the things we learned in those meetings and, and something you did really well which was um throwing all those different toys at toys at different <laughs> yeah. times i think i will always head, laugh when i give the toys out, but people love it bring a headgear next time but um <laughs> one of the eyes i think might have taken me out whatever it oh, was. the elmo <laughs> yeah exactly. but um i loved politicking I'm probably the biggest culprit. I probably yeah. had. Um, you mean the Trump. no politicking? Yeah, no yeah, politicking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I love politicking. I love politicking, <laughs> yeah. but it's really bad. Yeah. Um, and once you've got your point across, yeah. you can't then keep getting the same point across. I mm -hmm. think it's a really good lesson for people in meetings like yeah. to learn. Like You've said your point. If you say your point again in a different way, Still right? Same point? You just, all you're doing is politicking. Mm -hmm. You're just, and you're just making this meeting go on and on and on. Um, I love the idea of um, scout versus warrior 
Yes. I once told you about yeah, that. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Talk yeah. On Scout versus Warrior. And it's having that mindset of actually being able to listen to somebody and listen to what they have to say, mm. not listen to what they're saying so that you can defend your opinion or your position. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the warrior's mindset is adrenaline filled, have to defend mm -hmm. themselves, have to fight because they've been told that that is the way to go. And no matter what you cannot, you don't get to war. And then the guy on the front line convinces you to not fight him. Right. So the warrior can't <laughs> that do that. He has to go there and go, it, yeah. I will kill yeah. and defend my nation, whatever yeah. it might be. Whereas the scout has to use only facts. So they go out there, they climb on a tree, they look to see where their opposition is, where the other um, attacking forces are coming from, and they have to use 100% facts. They mm. can't come with a pre preconceived idea that they believe they were coming from the West, and they go, they must be coming from the West, even though there's a lot of reasons why they're probably coming from the other side, right? They're coming yep. from the East. So they have to go in with no preconceived ideas, and they have to actually take everything as um, take it to heart and listen to what they're being told. Mm. And I love that when we have meetings and, and I was often a big culprit until I watched that TED talk on it. Yep. Um, and yeah. What's I think, it called? What's the TED talk? Um, Do you remember? Warrior versus Scout. Oh, so yeah, Warrior versus Scout. Okay. Yeah. I think it's something about mindset. Um, I can send it to you. You can put it on the comments Yeah, that'd be really want. good actually. Yeah, 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 it's a great yeah. TED talk. I think it's, it's not too long, but yeah, it really um, changed the way I think about listening yep. and getting my point across in a meeting. Mm. Fair enough. Hey, tell me the word entrepreneur. We're talking about this before. Mm. Often misused a wee bit, I think, in New Zealand. We kind of think of an entrepreneur as being startups. What's your definition of an entrepreneur? Oh, because you're part of YPO, right? I am. Yes, and and, and actually, there's a what it, YPO. YPO. It's a young presidents organisation. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, what does it really mean? And, and yeah, what is that? I and mean, how do they view entrepreneurship? Oh, oh, jeez, I'm not going to. I'm not going to um, <laughs> give their view on it. No, like, no. Well, I'm how not, do you I'm view not, it? Sorry, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so. Entrepreneurship for me is there's so much more to it than it being startup life, mm. right? It's often um, seen as this glamorous lifestyle. I mean, I think I made a post the other day on LinkedIn that it's not sipping cocktails and sitting on a beach with your laptop, right? I wish. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. With everybody, we'd all be entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. It, it's a roller coaster, you know, it's a roller coaster in the dark. Mm. You don't know what's coming. That's a really good analogy. Like, yeah. It's wild, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and and media makes it look so exciting and glamorous. And, and I said the other day, it's more like Indiana Jones than it is James Bond, <laughs> right? James Bond sitting on cocktails, may, may shoot a few people and yeah. have some fun and be with a woman. Indiana Jones is, is getting it's caught like, in well, traps and, fuck, and trying to find his way down. out. <laughs> and we're all hoping he succeeds at the end and gets out, right? But we don't actually know at a certain stage, right? Yeah. And, and he's running away from massive balls riding down hills, right? <laughs> Um, and there's usually lots of snakes in the pit. Yep. But um, so so to me, it's not glamorous and it's not for everybody. Mm. Whereas I feel a lot of people want to be an entrepreneur and they're like, oh, but it looks so cool and, and it gets all this media hype. Um, but entrepreneurship is the journey. It's not starting a company, mm. right? Because yeah. starting a company is one tiny little aspect of being an entrepreneur. Yep. You've got the next 10 years ahead of that, maybe 20, 30, mm. 40 years ahead of it if you're lucky, yep. right? It's it's the ability to to go all the way yeah. and and have that grit. And I was, I was chatting to somebody just this morning about it, about grit. Grit is something you learn over time. Hmm. Grit isn't something you are taught. No. You know, grit is you got to go. you can't buy it. You can't train you can't, on it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it you, comes you from experience. You go through hardship to find out that you have grit, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then there's obviously all the terms. There's this hustle and there's. I'm I'm very lucky to be blessed with this insane amount of self belief. Like I really do believe I can do anything I put my mind to. It's and you said that on your post, was it your parents yeah. kind of gave you that self belief? I don't didn't know they? how. It's I don't know great what they did though. right. I mean, yeah. one of the few things maybe they did right. <laughs> Hopefully, they're not listening. But um, yeah, I've got this insane amount, and and Lisa will tell you that I have an insane amount of belief that whatever I do, yeah. I will be successful. Mm. Um, I realize that's crazy because I probably can't go. And play a soccer game against Ronaldo and beat him. But I actually think, this is dead honest, that I reckon I have a chance. Yeah. And I actually think you do. I actually believe I do. I reckon <laughs> yeah, I can be yeah. lucky enough, maybe put the right shot in the right place, and I might actually be able to beat him, right? Yeah. Which is crazy. I often think to myself, if I was put onto, um, in an All Blacks game, if I was put onto the field, I wonder if people would notice that I wasn't actually at that level. I reckon it would take them at least one half for them to realize. That's crazy. They'd notice in the first second. First of all, <laughs> I'd be the smallest guy in the field by like a million kgs, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. like, uh, but so entrepreneurship, <laughs> to go back to the point, 
<laughs> it's a journey. It's a long journey. Yeah. There are many different um, times in entrepreneurship and different times that you've got to be at a different level, right? Mm. What I love about entrepreneurship, and I think the best entrepreneurs are lifelong learners mm. because you have to continually develop your skills. So it's one thing to start up, right? It's another thing to then fly that airplane, right? Yep. If we use the analogy of jumping off the cliff, <laughs> yes. fly that airplane. It's another thing then to, to when you want to pivot or when you need to pivot, mm -hmm. having that ability, right? And then, and then you throw in raising capital. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like you've got to be skilled in, in many different things, right? Um, like a Swiss Army knife. Yeah. But what I have a bit of an issue with, with entrepreneurship, is that what gets huge, hugely um, glamorized is raising capital. Yeah. So in the media, such and such entrepreneur raised $2 million dollars fantastic that's incredible what about the entrepreneurs that have been are really grinding it out and hustling and turning a profit and doing really well mm -hmm. why are they in the news i can't work out like yeah there's not enough media hype around the people that are doing it hard and are actually you know being such still not, doing it and still and supporting still and people, all these people that they're employing we're the people yeah. cheering for them yeah right we don't really have that in our culture um But yeah, I think, I think if, if me, the media move, I don't mind. It's great. It's a great success to raise capital. Don't mm. get me wrong. Yep. It's, it's a, it's a huge need in the market. You do need to get capital if you want to create something great, mm -hmm. but there should be a follow on, mm. right? You raise the money. Brilliant. You're now turning a profit or great. You've now gone to market or, you know, whatever the next stage might be, it would be brilliant to see that more in the media yeah. and celebrate the successes of entrepreneurs mm. i think like, anyway i, I kind of went off in no, no 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 i agree because i think that you know a lot of the business i work with they've got good companies that they're employing you know somewhere between sort of 25 and 150 staff and they're mm. and they're you know they're supporting that their families and everything else um, but they're not necessarily sexy as in a lot of the the fundraising is for sexy things yeah, yeah what's the next yeah, unicorn sure. we talked about unicorns before yeah, right absolutely. and was it you who posted about the camel or was it lisa posted about the me. camel so me, tell yeah. me something about, about the because the camel is is really well, um probably what most of the established new zealand business who are entrepreneurs still are, right? Yeah. So the idea of the unicorn, um, in my opinion, should be, you know, thrown in the dustbin and, and gone because yep. there's such a tiny percentage, tiny percentage of people that actually achieve that status. Mm. Um, and it's all good and well to go for the BHAG, right? Big yeah. Hero Dash's goal. Let's go for it. Shiver the moon. moon if you shot. get there, great. Yep, yep. Absolutely, right? But too many people, and I think a lot of it comes from VC firms as well, trying to push for the one in 30 mm. that they need in order to to be successful as, as a um, venture capital firm. Yep. But with the with the unicorn, it's so difficult to achieve that status. Whereas, don't get me wrong, the um, the camel is, is still difficult, but it's something else that you're striving for. So if you're striving to be a camel, you're looking to be able to actually sustain your business through difficult times. Mm. You're looking at, it's more about a, an immediate path to profitability. Yep. It's not a moonshot. Look for us, what we're building next is, is maybe a moonshot, yep. but we're trying to build what's a camel that it can sustain itself. And at the same time, if you look at the camel and, and I really, the post, I put gave a lot more detail on it, but it's, it can sprint when it needs to. Mm. Right. Yeah. So like really fast. Exactly. Yeah. So they're really quick, but it knows exactly what it needs to do. It knows how to sustain its energy. So it doesn't just go randomly sprinting around the desert because it knows it has a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Right. So it doesn't waste excess funds or whatever resource or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and, and the camel can get through really hard times, but it also, and it can do it with a small amount of resources. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, the humps with the amount of water it can carry, et cetera. And that's how. I think, and, and I, it's not my idea. I mean, I, I follow. I saw it from somebody else who posted yeah. it. Um, but I think that's how I want to build a business. And I think probably more and more uh, with the way the economy's gone, um, people should be building camels, camels. not unicorns. <laughs> and if you build a camel, that's incredible, right? Yeah. Like, there's more likelihood of you building a camel than a unicorn. Mm. So... Yeah, and then again, I also don't use the word unicorn as much. We use minicorn. I know. Which yeah, I we talked about term, that. Yeah, the term <laughs> minicorn. Rather go for a hundred to a billion dollar company. Yeah. Um, which is probably more reachable than a over billion dollar company, which is a unicorn. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Now, get back to YPO. Um, mm. tell me why. What is YPO, and why are you part of that? Um, YPO is a community uh, made up of um, a third entrepreneurs, a third family offices, and a third um, professional CEOs mm -hmm. and we're just a community that um, 
you, you join, you pay membership to join, and we look out for each other. So it's a and, peer community. Yeah. yeah, it's a peer community. We look out for each other. We, um, It's really filled with um, lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. So it's full of education. We're constantly having different speakers come from overseas and, and putting on different events. And some of our own members might um, speak to us as well at times um, to tell us their journeys. Yep. Um, it's nice being around well, what I enjoy is being around like-minded people, um, having those other people who have gone through um, similar experiences. Um, you have to be under a certain age. So that's under, the young bit. Where's the young yeah, bit coming? So you've got yeah. to be under 45 years old oh, to get in. Um, <laughs> if you have got in before that, you get to stay on. Okay. Um, so they also so don't get older kicked members. out once you click. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. So um, I've got a few more years anyway, me. So um, yeah, you get under a certain age, you have to have revenue over a certain amount and you have to employ a certain amount of people. It's a huge global network as well. So yeah. it gives you the ability to reach out to anybody, any other YPO members around the world. Um, usually you find their reply within 24 hours as, mm. as, as members. Yep. And yeah, I've, I've got huge value in it because yeah. I can reach out to people in my industry that are, you know, captains of their industry in their, in their market. And we can um, feed off each other. And um, I've been asked one or two questions from other people. And yeah, it's yep. really, really helpful. Excellent. Hey, if there was one thing you could go back to your younger self and give them some advice on, what would it be? Wow. I just had a, um, I had a, you're going to make me emotional. <gasps> I, uh, <laughs> I had a, a silent retreat last week or two weeks ago, and there was a, a question around that, which was oh, quite emotional. Yes. But, um, if I could go back to the younger me, this is actually a question I have in, in the podcast that I want to launch. Um, sure. I think I would, I would tell myself that everything's going to be okay mm -hmm. and like just keep grinding it out and um keep working hard and you know i came from a really poor family so we didn't have a lot of money and when i started at 18 years old in the metal recycling world i started off as a laborer yeah. with a cutting torch um i wish i can go back to that guy and just say you know maybe, maybe don't take off as many mondays <laughs> you know, maybe don't get so drunk on the weekend with all your rugby friends yeah. um but but what i did worked because i did work hard Yes. Um, and that's what I would say to most people around that age is, is put in the work. Mm. If you work hard, good things will happen. Um, I worked really hard. I ended up running that, that entire company. 4,200 um, 4, people. 4,200 people. I yeah. ran it. Um, I'm still a shareholder of that company. So yeah, it was, a, it was a great journey, but the unknown at that stage is, you know, well, do I stay here? Don't I stay here? Do I get involved in something? You know, I couldn't do a degree. We didn't have enough money to go to university at the time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't as if that was an option. However, um, yeah, just knowing that everything's going to be okay and uh, and just keep sticking to the journey and, and, and keep grinding. Yeah. It's interesting, actually. I was going to ask, um, and I think well done in what you've got to for sure, but I mean, some people sort of say that, you know, I always say you've got to work hard too. I was, I think, I think you and I are fairly similar, right? So in my early days, no matter what job I did, I would always be going, what more can I do? How can I help? What can I do things better? And always just questioning. And as a consequence, I got moved up very rapidly through the various rungs of, of hierarchy. Um, but it was because I was always looking at how I could make things better and what mm. I could do differently. But, and so I kind of expect that ethic of hard work from, from people as well. But for a lot of the young people, they kind of go, well, you know, we shouldn't have to work long hours to, to prove ourselves. What do you say to that? Oh, look, everybody's got their own opinion. Yeah. Um, my opinion is, and it's because it's been my journey that I did have to work long hours to get anywhere. Yeah. So my experiences um, are very different to, yeah. I guess, the kids now um, or the younger generation now. Sorry. Um you know, I say, well, what would I say to my own kid? Yeah, I was going to say, well, say, say yeah. same thing. you've got two young, bo two I mean, young boys. I mean, yeah? the oldest is eight. You know, I want him to work really hard, but I also don't want him to probably go through what I went through, right? I yeah. mean, I worked really hard and, and every weekend for probably five years. I worked every single Saturday. Mm. Um, and the labor was tough, tough on my body. When I, when I look back, um, I wouldn't change it, yeah. interestingly enough. Um, it gave me all the experience that I needed to be able to arrive in New Zealand and set up a metal recycling business from scratch. In the yeah. beginning, I was the person on the front scale offloading people's youth. If people are listening and they remember delivering to us on the North Shore, you know, that was that me. Was I was the guy <laughs> delivering, right? I had yeah. PPE and I was um, not delivering. I was the guy um, offloading. Yeah. So having gone through that hard work, I had the ability to 
go back to it when I had got to a certain level, right? So mm -hmm. I'd got to level of being a, an executive director and shareholder in South Africa, come here, I was able to start again. Um, so it is very helpful. So what would I say to you? I mean, I believe that hard work will pay off. Yeah. Um, and it's not forever, right? It's like it's not forever. Uh, it's not forever, but it's really hard. And I say, what would I do if I look? You know, what would I say to the younger me? I at times was, what am I doing this for? Yep. And I can understand being twenty years old and going, what am I doing this for? Like, but but if you and that's why I would want to tell myself, you'll it's going to work out. Mm. Keep keep grinding. So what would I tell the twenty year olds now? I'd say keep grinding. Yep. Like do that hard work because if you also don't have the knowledge and you. Maybe you want to walk straight into a management role. That's fantastic. But what happens when the guy underneath you at a lower level has an issue mm. and you can't actually solve it? How are you going to be an exceptional manager? How are you going to progress in that company? How are you going to make a difference? Mm. How are you one day when you decide that you want to be an exciting, glamorous entrepreneur and go out on your own, not to live on the beach and, and <laughs> some cocktails, but to actually do the work? Yeah. How are you going to train your people? Mm -hmm. How are you going to start from the bottom? Yeah. If you've never actually done the hard work, what have you learned? Mm. Um, and also the other thing is on this topic. It's where what you get I would your grits go, from too, right? Pardon me? It's where you get your grits from too, Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and what I would go back and tell the young me is books aren't that bad. Oh, right? really? <laughs> I mean, like I was a jock at school. Yeah. I was more interested in um, entertaining the class and being a class clown and um, and playing sport than I was actually learning. Um and now I can't get enough of them. Yeah. I mean, you'll find me anywhere listening to an audio book. Like, mm -hmm. I'm in the gym listening to books. I'm in my car coming here now. I was listening to a book. I'm just like, I can't get enough of, um, of listening or reading books every night with my Kindle. So, and I didn't think of that at the time. So, um, <laughs> The younger me, I'd say start reading. Yeah. Start reading. The or or you listening. If you got, don't want to read, read, read or listen. When I was young, yeah. you couldn't listen to books. I know. Books, okay? So <laughs> I can't tell the younger me that. Hey, look, I'm <laughs> older. I'm older than you. I mean, we, we actually we used to actually have Walkmans and things if you yeah, wanted to listen exactly. to stuff. Yeah, yeah. Do that, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it would be um, yeah, listen, listen and read books as much as possible. So what are you listening to? What were you listening to on the way over here? Sure. So um, on the way here, I was listening to again, Good to Great. Yes. Um, which actually I think was first recommended by you. It was. Yeah. When I look back, um, absolutely love it. Um, I have kind of on an ongoing basis. I'm listening to "The Obstacle Is the Way," oh. which is by Ryan Holiday. Yeah, um, about stoicism. I've heard of it, but I haven't actually read it. Yeah, yeah, okay. really, it's an excellent book. I recommended it first when you're going through a tough time. So I've had a few of those, um, <laughs> and I've read it. And that at one stage, I read it four times in in like a few weeks, over and over, because it's just got such incredible gems. So if you're having a hard time and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, read the obstacle is the way. Mm -hmm. um, it's about stoicism. It's by Ryan Holiday and Tim Ferriss, who oh, obviously yeah. people will know Tim Ferriss. Um, and yeah, it just tells you how the Stoics believed in, you know, the obstacle becomes the way. And actually often it's there for a good reason. Okay. And you often can't see the reason. Yeah. But when you get through it, and it's, I'm the perfect example, when you get through it, you go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. I see why I had to have that obstacle thrown in my way mm -hmm. to be where I am now. So often you don't get um, what you want, but you get what you need. Yep. And you can't see it at first. So um, that that book I really and an entrepreneurship book. My favorite is Shoe Dog. Oh yeah, um, I yeah. haven't read that. Either. It's a Nike oh, story, right? Night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I've so got I a really few. I mean, it. I tell you what, I, I I used to love to read as a kid, but more fiction stuff. Right, and as right, an adult, right. I do love reading. Um, yeah, yeah, all kinds of books I'm listening to. But I only have a very very short commute in the morning, so okay. it's like about ten minutes. So I don't get a chance to listen to anything. Opposite um, of me. Yeah, and then I my Kindle. I tend to fall asleep at night while I'm reading yeah, my Kindle. Me too. But yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, that's cool. Hey, look, we could talk for hours. I know for we could. Sure, We've got so many things we could do. But so I think one of the things I've taken from that though is that you know it is. I love the analogy. I mean, it's a roller coaster in the dark it genuinely is mm. like having run several businesses myself had some successes had some massive failures that whole kind of uh, it is it's a, you just don't know what's coming up in the next yeah. whether it's up or down but you get to learn from it i think you know we get our grits we get our learnings from some of the things that go wrong more so than we do from the successes absolutely yeah agree. I couldn't what, agree more. top three tips what top three tips would you give to anybody who is you know either on the journey of building a, a great company from a good company or on the journey of, of entrepreneurship what are the three things you would say are the, the the biggest things for you um i love the flywheel yeah i love the flywheel just you know those those little wins uh, keep adding to it and you just start getting that speed up mm -hmm. right that momentum yep um and and celebrate the little wins as well yes. so celebrate those things and bring your team on the journey you know those things to me are really important so 
um, just to go back to it, the flywheel, it's all about um, gaining momentum. And over time, the flywheel is really heavy, but it just starts getting easier and easier to actually move. Um, I absolutely love that. But yeah, the celebrating success, it's, it's, it's got a lot to do with bringing your team on the journey because mm-hmm. often, and I've seen it and I've done it firsthand many times, um, your goal changes as soon as you succeed. And you've moved straight away. And, and you know, we won um, Best Emerging Business at the Westpac Awards. Mm. We won a whole lot of Westpac Awards. It was really exciting. But the next day, we're kind of moving on to, um, you know, what's the next goal, yeah. right? And that's great. And, and But you've got to get your team on that journey. They've got to actually understand that we succeeded. We did something. Mm-hmm. We set our minds to. Yep. We were successful. That's incredible. We can move on to the next stage. Obviously, we have to. But let's take a moment to actually um, enjoy the success because yeah. otherwise you're just on a treadmill, right? Mm, yeah. And you're just constantly looking for the next thing to do. And um, and you, I, I think you lose your culture in that. Yeah. And you lose um, the sense of belonging, mm-hmm. which to me is a massive part of being on a team. Um, I played a lot of sports in my time. Yeah. And the best teams succeed because they belong to something. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's really important. And I think um, I've been reading Dan Sullivan's The Gap and the Gain, um, and it's it's pretty much around that, as if you're always kind of looking for the next thing and the next thing. You are on the hamster wheel, and yeah. then you're not actually enjoying what is happening right here, right Absolutely. now. And in the beginning, he talked about this guy who was like, you know, he was like, once I get to 2 million, and then I'm going to be happy. And mm. then, then suddenly it was 5 million, then it was exactly. 10 million, then it was 50 million, Absolutely. and he actually ended up passing away. Yep. And he never actually achieved his happiness because it was always, well, when I get to here, when I get to here. So I think that's really important. And he always talks about, um, he talks about always measuring backwards as well. So it's easy to sit here and go, things are really shit right now um, and I'm not feeling very happy and I'm really you know, miserable. And then you kind of go, but where were you a year ago? And what has actually kind of happened in that year that you've moved forward, whether you haven't got to where you wanted to get to, you've yeah. actually still moved forward. Yeah. So celebrate what you have managed to achieve rather than always looking for the next thing. I think it's, I think that just in our day-to-day life, yep. not even just in business, no. like you you sit at home and, and you're just on that treadmill and you just, or the hamster wheel and you just keep going, keep going. But um, I try and do it as much as possible. And I'll say to Lisa, you know, where were we a year ago? And, yeah. and, and we are feeling frustrated because we haven't necessarily achieved something. But if I told you a year ago, we would be here. Mm-hmm. How would you feel? And often the answer is, oh my God, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have believed you. Yeah, I'm yeah. so excited. I would have been so excited if you don't. So then why aren't we excited? Yeah. Yeah, right, yep. because immediately it's all relative. Everything changes, and now we're thinking we got you, and now we should be there. Mm-hmm. But actually, just be okay with being here and celebrate being here. Yeah. Absolutely. And I see on your LinkedIn profile you talk about being, you know, a father, a, a, a husband, and a, a metal maven. Yeah, <laughs> now, for people who don't know what metal maven is, what is a metal maven? How would you describe it? Oh, just somebody who's enthusiastic, I guess, about it. Yeah. Um, a passion for metal. I've been doing it since I was 18 years old, so that's quite a few years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just a, a, an enthusiasm towards uh, metal and and I guess it's recycling, recycling. in particular. Yeah, because yeah. that was kind of your why, wasn't it, was to make sure that Absolutely. people actually re- recycled resources. Yeah, we wanted to incentivize the recycling more. Yeah, sure. cool. And you're about to launch your own podcast, aren't you, specifically around that topic. I am. Tell us Absolutely. a little bit about that. So um, it's – it's specific to exporters of recyclables, mm-hmm. um, actually recyclable metal. So metal recyclers in the beginning. Yep. Um, and it's really to educate and help other metal recyclers globally. So it's very much our toggle market is global. Yep. Um, and we're busy playing with the name at the moment. We've mm-hmm. got a few options. One's young, scrappy, and hungry. Oh, I like it. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, we're busy working with those at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, our target market is um, exporters of, of recyclable metal, yep. and we will be doing once a month. So every week we'll do a, a podcast, pet podcast, where we'll interview some sort of captain of industry, some legend in our field. Where luckily, from my previous role in South Africa, I yep. do know a lot of them, um, and I've already got the top ten, the first ten people to agree to oh, do it. Excellent. And once a month we'll do a masterclass. So a masterclass will be on something specific, like for example, that's going to um, help the exporters. So we might do something on foreign exchange and we'll have a foreign exchange person that will come in and they will do a mask where I'll ask questions and they will teach all the different exporters about this sort of thing. We might do something on marketing. Yeah. Um, I've already got the guy. In fact, I've got the person for marketing. I've already got the person for entrepreneurship, a guy who's literally just going out and starting new businesses in the recycling space in the States at the moment. He's doing wonderful things. Um, so he's going to come on and we're going to talk about entrepreneurship. So we'll do a monthly masterclass and a weekly interview of somebody in the industry that but the focus is really learning from experiences. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what 
like you said earlier, which I said I want to ask this, which what would you tell the younger you, yep. right? Um, and and I'm hoping that the younger them are listening. Yes. So it's it's what can they teach from their experiences and and pick up some gems. Hopefully, you know, if everybody could pick up one gem in every podcast that I do, mm-hmm. well, that's adding value. And, and if that can help them, well, that'll be wonderful. Fantastic. Hey, look, um, if people want to get a hold of you, Stu, either because you're passionate about metals or yeah, sure. just to talk to you in general and maybe about EOS and what your, your yeah, yeah. Um, journey on that one, how do they get hold of you? Um, LinkedIn yep. is probably the easiest. Uh, I'm posting every day at the moment. So Stuart Kagan yep. on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Tell all I, your I contact details there. are there. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Exactly. All my details, my email address is there. So that's easy. Oh, well, thank you so much for coming in. Really appreciate it. Thanks, uh, Look forward to following the next part of your journey. Awesome. Thanks for having right. me. It was lots of fun. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers.